everyone. It's Megan Dooley here. I'm an occupational therapist. And today we're going to chat about chapter three in the MBCOT um, review guide book. Uh, again, if you don't have this, I highly recommend that if you're planning to study for your um, MBCOT exam, that you at least purchase the book. Uh, if not, even joining um, a review session that they have, like a weekend course. But I'm here to just, again, provide some additional talking points on the different sections in the chapters. So as you study, if you're somebody who prefers to hear some of the language, um, you could also take each section and use it as a way to stay on track for what you're studying. So today I'm going to talk about chapter three. It's going to be broken down into the different sections of the OT process for each video to keep them shorter and a little more focused on what you should be reviewing within your text. So I'm going to just touch a little bit on the OT process. What is it? Um, we, we, should know what that is at this point if you're studying for your MBCOT, but I think it becomes muddled when you go on field work and you see parts of the OT process maybe more in front of your face than others, such as the intervention process. Maybe you don't see as much of the discharge planning depending on what setting you are in. If you're in acute care, if you're in inpatient rehab, oftentimes the caseworkers take a large component of that discharge process. So this is a great opportunity and a great chapter to just review what is very much set forth in your OT practice framework. That is another great referral source to be reviewing throughout this chapter. So the first part um, when we're looking at the OT process is the referral the screenings and the evaluation. So this would be starting on page 34 in your book. Some things to note and something to keep uh, at the forefront is that referrals can come from all different types of sources. It can come from a doctor, a psychiatrist, it can come um, from a community entity, it can come from a caseworker, a social worker. However, each state has their own rules as to how you can take that referral and when you can actually see that client. Some states say that you have to have a doctor's orders first. Other states like North Dakota say that I can um, get a referral from someone in the community, do an evaluation on that client, and then I have to get the plan of care signed by their physician. With that being said, that is something from your field works and going out on placements and things that you want to maybe push aside. And just remember that the referral system is going to be just solely based off of Medicare um, and AOTA standards of practice. So don't use that setting information that you maybe got, whether it was school, um, acute care, it doesn't matter that so much as what does Medicare and AOTA standards of practice say, um, which does list those different places that you could potentially get referrals. Again, we're talking, what do I need to know for my test and what's the reality of practicing once you get out into practice, it will be based on what your state says that you can take for referrals. Another area to highlight in this section, um, which is listed on page 34, is the screenings. Screenings are a great tool. You learn screenings in school, um, quick range of motion, manual muscles, quick manual muscle testing, um, all of your neuro-based screenings, uh, light touch, two-point discrimination. Those are all quick screens. You cannot uh, write goals off of screenings. Those are there to help you narrow down what main assessments you're going to be doing. So if I note that they have some decreased sensation, I should probably get out and do some two-point discrimination or actually do some testing uh, formally to identify you know, to what degree is that impacted. Uh, if I note that they are showing some deficits when I screen them for vision, I should do a full screening assessment or a full assessment or evaluation if I plan to write goals off of that. So if you see anything in your exams, your practice exams that say screening and then it asks you what would be the next step, it would not be establishing goals off of those results. It would be identifying that you're then going to proceed with a evaluation on visual perception, on balance, on um, whatever that may be, a, an actual full test on range of motion where you're measuring their range of motion. 
When we look at evaluations, there's a lot of parts to evaluations. I think sometimes we consider an evaluation to be uh, that assessment, that formal assessment component, but your evaluation is all that data gathering or information that you're taking in from that client. So this would be their health history. This would be their occupational profile. Your evaluation is considered all standardized and non-standardized assessments. It can be the interview process. When you're planning for your evaluation, and this is again, while you're thinking about questions on an exam, you want to make sure that when you're reading those exam questions, you're reading and underlining or again, writing on your uh, whiteboard, what is the setting? What do you know about that setting? If it's acute care, about on average, how long is a patient there? Three to five days. If it's a sniff, what are we looking at for that? Um, because that's going to help you select the appropriate evaluation um, navigation that you're going on. What about the diagnosis? Is it a progressive diagnosis? Is it a diagnosis that you can fully recover from? Huge difference in evaluation components of carpal tunnel surgery versus a stroke or a spinal cord injury um, versus you know, a broken arm or a hip replacement. You need to be aware of your client's goals and needs. Each client, as we know, is going to be very different because they have a different psychosocial context. They live in different homes, different towns. They have different jobs, different things that they need to be able to do or want to do. Another key component when reading these exam questions is once you're taking that setting into consideration, you want to also identify with what other disciplines may be involved in that setting. If we're in acute care or um, inpatient rehab SNF, those type of things, there's probably going to be other disciplines. In inpatient rehab, they have to have PT as well as OT. So what, how does that change my evaluation? I'm probably not going to be the one solely focusing on some of those overlapping performance skills that both PT and OT focus on. So PT may be looking at how far they can walk, doing a very um, thorough balance evaluation on them. I would focus more on those ADLs and um, more observational skills on the balance and how they're moving. Where if I'm doing outpatient therapy or um, going into their home or whatever that may be, or a sniff eval, you may focus a little heavier on that because you might be the only one. If you're doing EI and you're the chosen entity to go into the home, you're going to be covering more of those assessments to help out speech and PT and things like that. Prioritize the problem list from findings to create those interventions. So whatever you get from your evaluation, you wanna make sure that as we're working into the intervention phase, that you're taking those problem lists and prioritizing them. Um, there's many ways to do that, but you don't want to prioritize problems based on the occupation. It's what performance skills and client factors are impacting or environmental factors that are impacting their ability to be independent in those activities. So it may be balance. It may be cognition, vision. Their home setup could be a barrier. Um, their social support could be a barrier depression, anxiety could be a barrier to them being successful in maintaining a job. The next area to talk about would be those psych psychometric properties of assessments. Now, why is that important? We tend to hear that stuff pretty early on when you talk about reliability, validity. Um, it is very important for this exam that you understand those assessment tools, the validity, the reliability, how do you gather data? Um, because they are going to expect you to understand that a certain assessment isn't going to be appropriate for a kid who's five years old, where a different assessment may be appropriate for that age. They're wanting you to be able to identify if that assessment has been validated for people with TBIs, or is it only validated for people who have had a stroke? So you the best thing I can suggest in that um, realm is when you start going through, you know, popular assessments and things in the um, review guide, you're really going to want to make like a table 
that discusses these different areas. So they want you to understand what's the normative data. Is it based on a certain age range? It's really nice if you have a chart that says the Peabody. What's the age range for the use of that assessment? What type of diagnoses can you use that with? How is it scored? And what do you do with that data? So some data is just going to give you a score and all you're going to do for pre-post testing is see if that score has um, increased or decreased. Some things are going to put those children or adults into a category. So there's actual cutoff scores of what is normal for that age group. And these are very often seen in that school setting. They need to be two standard deviations below the norm to qualify for services. What assessments have that type of data. So it's very important that you know this um, and probably the best way I can suggest knowing that if you have not already done so is to make nice assessment charts. Again, the name of the assessment, what is the diagnosis that it's covered, what model or frame of reference goes with it so you kind of know what setting it may fall under, what is the age group, how do you gather the data, and then how, what are the results, how are those results presented. There are all sorts of different assessment tools. Again, I think sometimes people think of assessment tools as the Peabody, the bot, but any type of way of looking at your client or assessing them without actually making changes is a form of an assessment tool. So observing your client getting out of bed is a form of assessment. It's an observational tool. Okay. Interviews, your OT profile, or just simply asking them questions about home, um, about the current situation, that is a form of assessing them to understand their environmental settings, their psychosocial settings, the context in which they do everything. Checklists are great. Um, norm referenced, criterion referenced assessment. So anything that has you reading exactly what you should be saying to that client, all the way to that simple talking or watching them go to the bathroom, play with toys, eat their food. Those are all forms of assessment tools. Another key part of that referral screening and evaluation is our observational skills. It's important that we see clients actually doing tasks because we can take all sorts of data. We can say they have decreased range of motion, decreased cognition, uh, decreased sensation, but that does not directly state that they can't get dressed, that they can't toilet, because clients have ways of being able to adapt and accommodate, or they have an individual that's helping them. So to have a full, good, well-rounded evaluation, if I was asked a test question about what would be the best um, form or what is the best, you know, layout for my evaluation. If it included only um, formal or standardized assessments, probably not the best. But if it talks about observations, formal or standardized assessments, and then interviewing, that would be the best option because you are talking to them and getting a story about your client. You're seeing them do the activity but you're also testing to determine what performance skills and client factors are hindering their ability to be independent in that activity. The only thing you want to make sure to do or remember as you are studying for your exam is that you would want to validate those observations that you're making with a caregiver or that individual. You don't wanna just infer or imply that um, it's really hard or, it's, or they're unable. Remember, oftentimes you're going to be seeing these clients outside of their own home setting or community setting, which could lead you to um, make a false, you know, a false statement. So an example of this could be um, in our hospital when I worked in the rehab hospital, we had a, a stove there um, and the burners, the way to turn the burners on was in the back of the stove. Well, let's say you have an individual with a spinal cord injury. Um, they're maybe in because they've had some reoccurring UTIs or maybe they have pneumonia and you're going through kitchen safety with them and you observe that they're unable to turn on the stove. 
If you don't validate that with them or talk to them, you may miss out that they have their knobs placed on the front of their stove at home already, which makes them independent in the use of their stove. So you would make, um, maybe prioritize that as a problem that they are unable to safely turn on and shut off their stove. When in fact, just talking to them and validating that observation, they would inform you that, yeah, they can't do it on this type of stove, but they have modified or purchased a stove where the, the knobs are on the front. When looking at interview guidelines, it is very important that you identify before going into that interview, what is the purpose of your interview? What are you trying to get out of interviewing that individual? Make sure that each question is relevant to your um, hypothesis of what you're going to do with that client. If you're asking them about inappropriate questions would could be something like, how long have you been dating your boyfriend? Um, does, your, does your boyfriend, um, you know, there's, there's things that you don't want to push. And that's one of them. Relationship statuses or how long somebody has been with somebody. Is that really necessary to the amount of assistance they can provide you or provide somebody? Now asking somebody if they have a caregiver that lives in the home with them, that would be appropriate. If somebody um, has a really good friend who is coming to a lot of therapies and um, they state like, oh, this is my roommate, um, a female person states, this is my roommate. She and I live together. She's going to be helping me. And you then proceed to ask your client, well, are you romantically involved with that roommate? That is not appropriate. Um, so make sure that your questions, although you want to get to know your client and build rapport and understand them just as they want to understand you, make sure that it is um, purposeful towards your evaluation, your interventions, and the goal medically and professionally of what you're trying to achieve with that person. At that same time, you want to build rapport and develop trust. This can be done through your words. Oh, you can trust me. I'm not here to judge you. I just want to help you. But also through nonverbals. If you're very um, cold, arms crossed, or very mm -hmm, mm -hmm, jotting down notes, um, that can appear to be as if you are judging them or feeling as if you're superior. And so you want to make sure that you're reading their body language throughout that interview process. Are they putting their head down while talking? Are they looking around? Do they seem very fidgety? If so, take a minute and, and just talk. Maybe share a little bit about yourself that you are comfortable sharing. If they ask you a question, be truthful and honest. Be truthful and honest. I cannot say that enough. Um, you may want to be protecting them or it may be a difficult uh, conversation, but if you are truthful and honest with them, you are immediately building that trust and rapport with your client that you are going to be there for them no matter how hard it could be um, and that you uh, respect them as a person and you're not trying to keep them out of something that may impact their recovery, their care, their discharge, and overall their life. Once you have finished your interview, you need to develop a plan based on information gained from the interview. Again, you guys, I'm talking about this so that this is clicking in your head for when you're reading test questions, okay? I know this sounds like I'm lecturing you on what you need to do in the field. I am inferring all of this as you need to have this in your head when reading test questions. The more you tell yourself, this is the steps I would take as a therapist, the more that it's going to stick in your head for reading those test questions. Well, what do I do once I get the interview done? If you're reading a test question that um, says, oh, you have completed the interview, uh, what is the best course of action with that information? Well, you want to develop a plan based on that information about how you're going to proceed um, beyond the evaluation. So the interview is part of the evaluation, but we're always thinking, okay, if Throughout that evaluation, you find out they have decreased range of motion. They have um, cognitive impairments. But in your interview, you learn that they have support. They live near a community center. Um, they have a bus that goes by their home. Now you're building that plan of what you're going to develop as your interventions and how you're going to prioritize your problem list. And finally, you want to take into consideration if these are younger individuals, 
the developmental stages of your clients. So if they're an adult, they were fully, you know, developed typically and then, and then sustained some sort of um, an incident or had an accident, um, that they were fully developed, okay? So that doesn't need to be fully taken into consideration. If you're working with pediatrics um, or you're working with somebody who is now a young adult, an older adult, but they have um, a developmental delay, so they maybe had CP, um, Down syndrome, and now you're seeing them because they had a hip replacement or uh, they fell and you know broke a bone or they have back problems as an adult, you're going to want to make sure that you understand that that developmental stage plays a crucial role in their occupational performance. If you're working directly with children, you, you want to, again, this is for your test, um, make sure that you are conducting family teacher interviews um, at home, in school, that you're seeing what home or school is like and making observations. You want to have family center priorities. So as you're making those goals with that child, you want to make sure that the family is involved in those decisions because they are going to help implement those strategies because kids aren't going to come home and, you know, sit down and do their therapeutic exercises or a worksheet or typing tests without that support um, and encouragement from their family. You want to make sure that when you're looking at the developmental stages that you're looking at different developmental patterns, their balance, the symmetry of their body, um, right and left, are their hips aligned, is their pelvis aligned. Um, you want to make sure that you're considering uh, proper positioning for those individuals, looking at sensory processing, which we're going to talk about further on, and then looking at visual and auditory status. So. Make sure that you're just pulling in that developmental component and taking that into consideration when you are choosing your evaluations and when you're looking at the child's ability to complete shoe tying, getting dressed, um, brushing their teeth. Where are they at developmentally? Where should they be at? And how is that impacting their occupational performance? So this is just a little snippet on referrals, screenings, and evaluations, and some key points to really take into consideration when preparing for exam questions that relate to this topic. If you have any questions, please see the information below, reach out, um, or you can pose a question or reach out in the Facebook group Mentorship with Megan. Have a great day.